Good afternoon. We start this afternoon with portfolio questions, and question number one is from Ian Gray. Ask the Scottish Government what the impact could be on Scotland's future ability to develop and promote its culture of the reported reduction in funding for music tuition in schools. Minister Alston Allen. This Government recognises the importance of the role that music, culture and creativity play in people's lives across Scotland, which is why our culture budget has increased by almost 10%. Music tuition is of enormous benefit to young people and contributes to Scotland's future ability to develop and promote its culture. The Scottish Government is actively providing leadership to encourage participation in music. With regards to instrumental music tuition, local authorities are directly responsible for spending in schools. Overall, funding to councils is increasing in real terms despite continued UK Government cuts to Scotland's resource budget. While respecting the autonomy of local councils, Scottish ministers are concerned about changes in some local authorities to the provision of instrumental music tuition and have committed to working in collaboration with partners to find solutions that help ensure instrumental music remains accessible to all. Ian Gray. Uh, well, uh, President Officer, the culture budget may have increased, but local authorities' budgets uh, have fallen by over 7% in real terms since 2013. So there is no wonder that they struggle with this and many have had to increase or introduce charges for instrumental tuition. There is really only one solution to this. Will the Minister suggest to his colleagues, the Finance Secretary and the Education Secretary, that they provide new and guaranteed funding centrally in order to deliver affordable or better still free instrumental tuition in our schools for the sake of Scotland's cultural future? Astra. Well, while the member and I agree about the importance of music tuition in schools, uh, I have to point out that he mentions the figure 7%. 7% uh, is, of course, uh, the real term cut which this government, which this parliament has received uh, uh, from the UK government uh, since 2010 2011. Now, councils, uh, as I've mentioned, are, uh, despite that, receiving uh, a real terms uh, increase in the the share of the, the budget which we're able to give to them. Um, but I think it is important to say that some councils, and I can think of some, I could name some, uh, not least, um, for instance, uh, the council in uh, West Lothian, which has, uh, big, I beg your pardon, Mid Lothian, um, which has increased its uh, fees from, from nil to 205 pounds. Uh, there are some councils who will wish to take a look at their action uh, in terms of uh, what we, I hope we can agree on uh, which is that uh, free uh, or music tuition should be available uh, in an accessible form and should not uh, uh, prejudice its availability to anyone on grounds of their income. Liz Smith. Uh, thank you. Could I ask the Minister whether he would give Parliament a guarantee that within the Scottish Government's working group on music tuition just now, that they will look at the private partnerships deal with um, public partnership? Because obviously if it is a question of finding additional money, which it seems to be, then that partnership deal could be very important. Cabinet, Sir Minister. Well, the Scottish Government uh, always works in partnership uh, with different agencies. I think it's, it's worth saying in, in the context, however, of, of music tuition um, that uh, there has long been uh, an agreement since uh, the days of the, uh, uh, the working group on um, music tuition in schools, instrumental tuition, um, that uh, any course which is leading to an SQA qualification should be provided free uh, and it would certainly concern me if there were evidence of that not happening around the country. Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Officer. On the subject of music tuition, will the Minister join with me in wishing Systema Scotland Chairman Richard Holloway all the best in his recently announced retirement? Cabinet Secretary, the Minister might be aware that the Richard Holloway spoke recently at a reception here in Holloway that I hosted for the 10th anniversary of the Sistema Scotland's Big Noise Orchestras. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that one of Richard Holloway's legacies is transforming the lives of children, young people and communities through an intensive and immersive musical experience, thus significantly improving the potential of people from disadvantaged areas to live a more enriched and fulfilled lives? Minister. Richard Holloway certainly does deserve uh, congratulation uh, on that uh, count. The, uh, his vision and drive have been fundamental to creating uh, and extending Systema Scotland's outstanding work in our communities, which has benefited so many children in these last uh, 10 years. 
Systema Scotland has been a huge success uh, in the members' constituency and elsewhere and is making a real and positive impact in our communities. Systema Scotland now reaches 2,500 children weekly and independent evaluation has highlighted that as well as increasing the confidence, aspirations and self-esteem in the children and young people involved, Systema Scotland is making a real and positive difference uh, to communities across Scotland. Question number two, Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to promote tourism in areas served by the M74. Yes, sir. Transport Scotland have uh, recently introduced signs to the M74 that signpost uh, its nearby towns, such as Dumfries, Lockerbie, Gretna and Ecclefechan. Visit Scotland currently has a £130,000 memorandum of agreement with Dumfries and Galloway Council to promote the region. Visit Scotland will also receive £500,000 for marketing the south of Scotland region in 2018-19. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the fact that towns across my constituency are finally on the motorway signs. But uh, will uh, the Minister uh, undertake to uh, put pressure on Transport Scotland to reconsider their rules around brown signs for tourist attractions? Because many of the smaller uh, tourist attraction tourist businesses across Dumfries and Galloway are struggling uh, to make their way through the bureaucracy. Alistair Allen. Well, well uh, I can't claim to, to speak for, for Transport Scotland uh, directly on this matter. I, I will make sure that uh, the member has a response on that. Um, suffice to say uh, that uh, I think the, the pressure that has been uh, put on this issue from, from a number of members in the south of Scotland, I hope has been uh, helpful in ensuring uh, that the places I mentioned are highlighted on these signs. Uh, but we should certainly also be open to, to all ideas to make sure that uh, both Dumfries and Galloway and the borders uh, are made uh, much more clearly advertised uh, and the, the, the beauty of that region is more clearly advertised to all who visit Scotland. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary is aware of my ongoing campaign to encourage people to visit South West Scotland and now the Minister is aware. And I echo Oliver Mundell's comments. Uh, current signage on the M74 from the Central Belt going south gives the impression that there is nothing for 90 miles until you reach Carlisle. Will the Minister agree to meet me to explore options for adapting M74 signposts to feature Bonnie Dumfries and Galloway and the beautiful Scottish borders with the aim of encouraging further tourism, which will in turn give the local economy a much needed boost? Minister. Well, uh, as someone who originally is a native of the borders, I would similarly take offence to the idea that there is nothing between Glasgow and Carlisle, if that is at all being suggested by anyone, uh, and certainly can uh, also uh, pay uh, credit to the fact that the member herself has, I know, uh, raised this issue with, uh, uh, with the government and with Transport Scotland, and I believe has had some uh, results, as we mentioned, on uh, the issue of naming uh, individual towns and villages. Uh, uh, her comments about naming regions uh, and uh, the wider south of Scotland uh, borders and the Fries and Galloway region are now on the record uh, and uh, I hope will be, by, be noted by all concerned. Question number three, Tavish Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether the promotion of Scotland as a destination for film, television and other productions is best achieved through Creative Scotland. Minister. We backed the screen sector with an additional £10 million of funding this year and approved the joint proposal from Creative Scotland and its partner skills and enterprise agencies to set up a dedicated screen unit within Creative Scotland. That unit, which will be led by a new executive director with screen industry expertise, it will bring increased focus and coherence to public sector support for the film and television industry. Plans for its delivery are well underway and the promotion of film and television, which is already carried out by Creative Scotland, uh, will, I believe, sit best within the unit. Scott. Uh, Presiding Officer, uh, Parliament's Culture Committee agreed unanimously and on a cross-party basis uh, to support the pr promotion of, film, of Scotland as a film and television location uh, as a separate standalone organisation. Given the overwhelming evidence that we heard from industry supporting that position, why doesn't the government accept it as well? Minister. Well, the, the report uh, certainly uh, recognised uh, the contribution of the screen unit for the work it does, and uh, I welcome the fact that it acknowledged that. Uh, I do believe that uh, the, the, uh, the, the method that has been set out, that uh, has been identified uh, of supporting screen is the best one, rather than creating new agencies, since 
2007 record public investment uh, has gone into screen. Uh, but in terms of the issues that the member raises uh, around structures, it's important to say too that there are three industry reps uh, on the advisory committee on screen and also that we are recruiting three new members uh, onto the Creative Scotland board specifically uh, to represent uh, expertise in film too. So uh, I don't agree with the member's view about a standalone agency, but I'm sure we are agreed uh, on the importance of supporting the industry. Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The question from Tavish Scott talks about promotion of Scotland for film production. Back in 2013, Fiona Hislop said what we need is a film studio, particularly with a very effective sound studio as part of that complex. Uh, we still don't have a film studio in Scotland. Um, the new uh, screen unit's action plans include finalising a business case for studio capacity and securing new space within 12 months. Is the Minister confident that the screen unit can deliver this? Minister. Well, um, we uh, share the sector's ambition to, to see the creation of additional film and TV infrastructure working uh, with Creative Scotland and Scottish Enterprise. Uh, we continue to actively encourage proposals from developers and to stand ready to assist in any way appropriate to aid their delivery. We have welcomed and we continue to welcome proposals from developers and uh, we are, as I say, willing to assist uh, in any way appropriate to aid uh, progress on that front. Uh, Scottish ministers have granted planning permission in principle to develop uh, a mixed-use studio development at Pentland on the outskirts of Edinburgh, uh, which is one uh, example of our commitment in this area. Question number four, Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to support community groups to ensure that they leave a cultural legacy from the Year of Young People activities. Minister. A great deal of activity is currently underway to make this year a, a catalyst for new ways of working uh, with uh, young people at a local level. Uh, through our Create 18 fund, the government is supporting young people to work with community groups throughout Scotland to plan and deliver high quality community events, helping young people to showcase their talents and contributions to their local communities and helping to change attitudes and perceptions of young people. We're also working with local authorities to give young people the opportunity to have their voices heard and to create a lasting cultural change by putting uh, young people at the heart of local decision making and the co-design of the services which they use. Claire Hockey. I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, groups like Universal Connections in Rutherglen and Cambus Lang and Terminal 1 in Blantyre have events planned throughout the year to mark the Year of Young People, from the Forever Young event in Cambus Lang to the musical showcase featuring children from across my constituency of Rutherglen. It's good to see local groups fully on board with this great initiative. Can the Minister advise on whether a legacy evaluation will be undertaken to measure the success of this year's Year of Young People in order to learn from the positive lessons for the next themed year in 2020. Minister. Yes, we are developing an evaluation framework for the Year of Young People, which will ensure that the aims and objectives and the outcomes of that year are met, and uh, that will measure the success of co-designing Scottish Government policies too, uh, in order to create a lasting legacy beyond 2018. Now, all of that complements the uh, evaluation which Young Scot themselves are leading, uh, and uh, they are doing so uh, looking at the overall co-design element of the year. So the Scottish Government is certainly committed to ensuring that the programme of themed years engages with young people and will continue to invite representatives from uh, children and young people's organisations to join with us directly uh, to make sure that their interests are fully represented. Lee MacArthur. Thanks very much, uh, President Officer. Um, one community group already doing invaluable work in supporting young people in the islands I represent is the Orkney Youth Cafe. Unfortunately, um, funding difficulties mean that if not resolved uh, by the autumn, the doors of the Youth Cafe could close. Could I ask the Minister, therefore, to ask his officials uh, to engage in directly with the board of the Youth Cafe to ensure that one of the legacies of the Year of Young People is not the closure of this vital facility? Minister. Well, while uh, I've not been involved personally with uh, that particular uh, organisation, I am very happy to accede to, to the member's uh, request to, to ensure that officials uh, uh, do meet with him and, and with the board uh, to see if uh, there are any uh, opportunities for a conversation there that would be helpful. Elaine Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that for community groups to deliver invaluable cultural benefits, support from 
qualified youth workers is needed, but evidence given by Unison Scotland to the Local Government Communities Committee last year stated that youth worker jobs have been substantially cut across Scotland. So does the Minister agree with me that job losses in services will leave a negative legacy in communities who have suffered the brunt of these austerity cuts? Yes. Well, clearly the, the contribution of uh, youth workers is very important to a number of the programmes that we're mentioning. Uh, again, some of these, in some cases, these will be uh, employees of local authorities, and I don't wish to repeat the points I made earlier. Uh, however, uh, the Scottish Government is always willing to, to work with all who seek uh, to promote uh, not just youth workers, but also the, the people they work with. Question number five, Ivan McKee. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on organisations in the culture and tourism industries that discriminate on the basis of ethnicity operating in Scotland. Minister. Well, equality is at the heart of the Scottish Government's ambitions for a, a prosperous and fairer Scotland, and uh, it is critical to how we meet the challenges and seize the opportunities that will allow us to thrive in the 21st century. We published the Race Equality Action Plan in December 2017, outlining more than 120 actions we will take over the course of this Parliament to secure better outcomes for ethnic minorities in Scotland. Ivan McKee. Thank you. The Minister may be aware that Israeli airline Israel is commencing flights from Edinburgh to Tel Aviv shortly. Unfortunately, millions living in the area itself will be unable to board these flights in Edinburgh Airport solely on the basis of their ethnicity as Palestinians living in the West Bank are not allowed to fly through Ben Gurion Airport, unlike Jewish Israelis living in settlements next door. Does the Minister agree with me that such discrimination on the basis of ethnicity has no place in modern Scotland? Minister. Well, the, the Scottish Government would, would clearly deplore and condemn any institution or business for that matter which discriminated against it, its customers on the basis of their ethnicity or their religion or their uh, nationality. Um, it's up to the UK Government to decide which airlines fly to the UK, but the, the Scottish Government's uh, views about the, the rights of uh, the people of Palestine are, are a matter of record uh, and uh, ones which are widely shared uh, across this Parliament. John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, can the Minister confirm that the Scottish Government, through, for example, its enterprise agency or Visit Scotland, will not support financially or otherwise businesses or organisations which operate within a system of apartheid, such as outlined by Ivan McGee? Minister. Well, uh, Visit Scotland don't have a, a relationship with the, the airline in question, uh, and uh, that's, uh, the, as I understand, the flights in question uh, are inbound charter flights weekly. They are not, um, they're not a flight uh, or they're not a service which is promoted directly to customers within Scotland. Um, Visit Scotland, as I say, don't have an ongoing relationship with them. Question number six, Ash Denham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its talks with the EU following the First Minister's recent meeting with Michel Barnier. Ask them all. The First Minister visited Brussels on the 28th of May for a series of engagements which included a meeting with Michel Barnier. Michel Barnier showed an openness to listen to the Scottish Government's views on the Brexit negotiations. The First Minister outlined key issues of concern for Scotland, including the need for urgent clarity on the future EU-UK relationship and the strongly held Scottish Government position that Scotland and the UK as a whole should remain within the EU's single market and customs union. Ashton. Would the Minister agree with me that a no-deal Brexit would be catastrophic for Scotland and its economy? And would he also share my concerns that the UK Government, having allocated less than a day to debate and vote on all of these amendments to the EU withdrawal bill? Yes. Well, as the, the member clearly uh, appreciates, and many other members will appreciate, it is important to understand just how helplessly confused the UK government's present position is. I noticed on my way here, just watching uh, first, uh, Prime Minister's, I beg your pardon, Prime Minister's questions, um, where the, the Prime Minister seemed more willing and able to give an account uh, of the House of Lords versus House of Commons pigeon race, uh, important though I'm sure that the cause represented there was, uh, then she was able to offer any explanation of how either the Lords or the Commons would, would reach a conclusion about the hurried bill uh, in question. Uh, I also think it, it is uh, quite a, a situation for us all to have reached um, where we are debating um, some of the, the most dire consequences of a no-deal Brexit and uh, we should all uh, work together to ensure such a thing never happens. 
Thank you very much. And that concludes our cultural tourism and external affairs questions. We turn now to questions for the just, to justice and the law officers. And we start with question number one for... Sorry, we'll just wait a few seconds. The ministers take seats. And we start with question number one from Gillian Martin. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met a divisional commander for the North East Division of Police Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. I regularly meet with the designate Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Constable of Police Scotland, Ian Livingston, who has responsibility for operational policing across Scotland. I understand that uh, DCC Livingston met with representatives from Aberdeen City Council, uh, uh, Aberdeenshire and uh, uh, Murray Council on the 29th of May to discuss a range of issues relevant to policing in the northeast of Scotland. Gillian Martin. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The North East area can struggle to recruit people into public service as it has to compete with a relatively high wage labour market and a housing market that is stubbornly expensive. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline what's been done to make policing an attractive career proposition? And can he point to any discussions he's had with the uh, Divisional Commander on specific training and professional development initiatives in the North East Division? And what's been done to enhance policing skills, particularly in a changing landscape where crime moves off the streets and goes online? Cabinet Secretary. So, um, uh, there have been a number of challenges with recruitment in the North East, uh, which is due to the particular economic situation uh, within that region. Uh, and there has been concerted efforts made on the part of uh, Police Scotland in order to enhance the recruitment uh, approach there. I'm pleased to say to the member that this has resulted uh, in Police Scotland confirming that there is a full complement uh, being met within the North East as a result of these actions. The member may also be interested to know uh, that police officer pay for uh, new recruits uh, to Police Scotland is the highest in the UK. Uh, new recruits into Police Scotland receive a salary of over £24,000 a year, uh, while in England and Wales, new officers uh, could currently receive just under £20,000 on starting. And I understand that there are proposals to drop that further to £18,000 uh, for apprentice uh, police officers. Uh, Police Scotland's uh, recruitment, training and development uh, work uh, is continuing and that's been taken forward by the Interim Chief Constable. Uh, but I know that a new leadership and talent team in Police Scotland is currently taking forward uh, a leadership strategy. Uh, and this will provide leadership development at all levels and take forward new options uh, for talent man management and career development, including for those within the uh, northeast of Scotland. In relation to the member's point uh, regarding cybercrime and cyber capabilities, uh, which are key priorities within the 2026 strategy, Police Scotland is committed to recruiting suitably cyber skilled specialists to counter the threat of cybercrime. And a new cyber hub in Aberdeen has recently opened, where uh, cyber officers and staff uh, are co located with appropriate technology and equipment. Uh, that will bring their overall investment over the course of uh, the five cyber hubs to some five million pounds in order to help to ensure that they can address the increasing threat coming from cyber crime. Liam Kerr. Presiding officer, in the northeast, anti-social behaviour has skyrocketed. It's up 41% in Aberdeen, 34% in the Shire and 20% in Angus. Perhaps due to the issues Gillian Martin highlights, the number of local divisional officers is falling. The number of special constables is near enough half since the formation of Police Scotland. And the Crime and Justice Survey tells us fewer people than ever are aware of a regular pat police patrol in their area. So does the Cabinet Secretary accept that there is a link between less visible policing and increased anti-social behaviour? Minister. Uh, President officer, as ever, the member does tend to take a rather simplistic approach to these uh, matters. Um, he recognised that in tackling antisocial behaviour, it's important that a range of different agencies work in cooperation to deal with that. Uh, Police Scotland are an important element of that, and alongside that, local authorities and other voluntary organised and community-based organisations. So what's important is that the local authorities in the northeast of Scotland work in partnership with Police Scotland in addressing issues relating to antisocial behaviour. And I hope the member will be realistic and will also be rather honest in the approach he takes to this and encourages the local authorities in the North East to make sure that they are working in a cooperative fashion with Police Scotland to address these types of issues in an effective and a responsible manner. 
Question two has not been lodged. Question three, John Finney. Um, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service ensures that the anonymity of rape complainers is protected during and subsequent to trial. Solicitor General Alison de Rollo. Thank you. The Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service is absolutely committed to supporting rape complainers and giving their evidence at trial. Section 92.3 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 enables the court to clear and close the courtroom during the evidence of the complainer in a rape or similar sexual offence case. Prosecutors routinely make this application to the court to support the complainer in giving her best evidence and to protect her identity. The decision to clear the courtroom is for the court, but represents an important and appropriate departure from the general principles of open justice and that criminal proceedings are held in public. At the same time, the established practice of the Scottish media is that the identities of those making sexual complaints will be protected. Guidance is provided to the media in the published Independent Press Standards Organisation Editor's Code of Practice. John Finney. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Solicitor General for that comprehensive and reassuring uh, response. The Solicitor General will understand concerns exist about victims of uh, rape being identified online, particularly on social media, and the use of autocomplete functions by search engines such as Google can result, uh, also result in people who are searching for information on a case being presented with details of the complainer. Has the Crown Office Procurator Fiscal Service held any discussions with Google, Facebook, Twitter, or any other such companies regarding this issue? And can the Solicitor General indicate if there's been any convictions as a result of a person's anonymity being breached, please? Solicitor General. The internet and social media in particular undoubtedly present a set of challenges for the administration of justice and, and indeed all other aspects of civilised society in Scotland. Um, so far as rape complainers and protection of their identity is concerned, uh, COPFS would encourage any rape complainer to bring any matters of concern to the attention of the authorities. And certainly for our part, the Crown would consider the facts and circumstances of both the individual case and the related posting or publication uh, in order to decide whether any prosecutorial action was available and in the public interest. Fear of unwanted publicity is a natural and legitimate concern among raped complainers and the views, interests and welfare of those complainers are at the heart of the work that we as prosecutors do in bringing sexual offenders to justice. <coughs> Equally, the Scottish Government is committed to supporting the needs of witnesses to help ensure that they can give their best evidence with the minimum anxiety about the process, including anxiety about anonymity not being protected uh, throughout their lifetime. So it's a wider issue than simply the prosecution um, of crime. Um, cases will be examined to see whether individual criminal offences have been committed, but um, there is a bigger picture, a wider set of issues, and I'm confident that um, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, who, who would be responsible for, for wider legislation in this area, would be uh, interested to hear and give careful consideration to evidence about uh, particular concerns and the way the uh, system currently operates at present. Thank you. Question for Linda Fabiani. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it will report on the consultation on its review of the regulation of legal services. Mr Annabel Ewing. Uh, the Member will be aware that the review of the regulation of legal services is independent of the Scottish Government and is chaired by Esther Robertson. I'm aware that the review undertook a call for evidence earlier this year, and I understand that the Chair intends to publish the consultation responses shortly. I expect the final report in the autumn. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you. May I ask the Minister to take careful cognizance of anything that is written in that report about the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission and the ability of citizens to be able to take complaints about solicitors and cases further on appeal. At the moment, I have constituents who are finding themselves disenfranchised uh, as they don't have the ability to appeal anywhere other than the court of session, which, of course, is prohibitively expensive. Minister. Thank you, President. Obviously, I should just, in light of that particular question, perhaps uh, refer members to my entry in the Register of Interest, wherein they will find that I am a, a, a member of the Law Society of Scotland. I do hold a practicing certificate, albeit I'm not currently practicing. What I would say to the member is that this independent review of the regulation of legal services is also considering uh, how to improve the complaints process. And I feel quite confident that we will see 
uh, recommendations uh, uh, along those lines when uh, the, uh, Esther Robertson uh, presents her report. But I can also say to the member that in the meantime, the Scottish Government is working with the Law Society of Scotland and the SLCC to identify improvements that can be made in the shorter term. Those improvements will require secondary legislation, presiding officer, which we will bring forward to the Parliament after the summer recess. Gordon Linters. I would remind those in the Chamber of my entry in the Register of Interest as a practising advocate. Um, following on from the question that has been put to the Minister, does the Minister agree with the current SLCC Chair Jim Martin, who commented that the current legal complaint system is simply not fit for purpose? Will the current system now be overhauled to protect consumers and provide proper regulation? Yes, sir. Uh, I can say to the member that I have had uh, uh, several conversations with the SLCC and with the Law Society of Scotland, and uh, I think it's fair to say they don't always uh, take the same uh, uh, view uh, of these matters. Uh, but uh, as I have said to Linda Fabiani, uh, the uh, report that we have commissioned, the review rather of the regulation of legal services that the Scottish Government has commissioned Esther Robertson to complete, uh, will report uh, 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 soon. Uh, and as I say, uh, we will reflect carefully on the uh, recommendations put forward and uh, will uh, thereafter engage uh, in a wide discussion in which I would invite Mr Lindhurst to participate. Question number five, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the level of recorded crime was in 2006-07 and the last year for which figures are available. Cabinet Secretary. In 2006-07, there were 419,257 crimes recorded by the police. Uh, the latest year for which national statistics are available is 2016-17, when 238,651 crimes were recorded. This represents a 43% decrease, uh, which includes a 49% fall in non-sexual crimes of violence. The national statistics for 2017-18 will be published in September this year. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that very positive answer, and I'm delighted that, thanks to the hard work of our police officers, the policies of this SNP government, and the fact that people are generally becoming more law-abiding, that crime has fallen so substantially, making our streets and communities safer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree, though, that there is no room for complacency, and that a continued focus on reducing all crimes, but specifically domestic violence and those of a sexual nature, remains crucial? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, I agree with the member that whilst we should welcome the very significant reductions that we have saw in crime, uh, we can never be complacent and we need to maintain our focus on reducing levels further, including those areas, uh, raised, uh, uh, the areas the member raised in relation to domestic violence and sexual crime. Uh, the Scottish Government uh, have published its Equal Safety Delivery Strategy, which sets out a range of actions which we are taking to tackle violence against uh, women and uh, girls. And the member will also be aware that we uh, took through the uh, Domestic Abuse uh, Scotland Bill, uh, which introduced a new offence uh, that criminalises a course of abusive behaviour towards a partner or ex-partner, and crucially includes the issue of psychological uh, abuse alongside that of physical harm. Alongside that, sign officer, we have provided some £30 million between 2017 and 2020 to support a large range of projects to tackle domestic abuse and violence against women. Uh, on an issue of uh, sexual crime, uh, the Solicitor General and I have established uh, an expert group to look at the prevention of sexual offending involving young people. And the group will identify fresh actions uh, that we can take in order to prevent uh, these harm harmful behaviours uh, being conducted by young people and uh, mitigate the effects that they have. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One concerning aspect in the most recent uh, statistics on recorded crime was uh, the continuing trend regarding falling detection rates. Detection rates in the capital continue to lag the rest of the country, just a third of crimes being detected compared to around a half for Scotland as a whole. So in the context of the most recent plan submitted to the SPA board, and given that local federation members have told me that police time is stretched more than ever in Edinburgh, does the minister agree with me that if capacity is created, that that should mean more officers on the street rather than fewer? Cameron Secretary. Uh, officer, I recognise the concern which the member has raised. And in the last couple of years, for example, within the Edinburgh area, there have been particular problems around housebreakings, uh, which uh, Police Scotland have taken action 
uh, in regard to specialist operations being mounted within the capital in order to address those types of concerns uh, where they have identified uh, an ongoing uh, problem. And no doubt local commanders uh, through the uh, uh, executive team within Police Scotland will look at what further measures need to be taken here in the capital uh, and in other parts of the country where there are particular localised issues um, around detection matters and also uh, particular types of uh, crime. Uh, the member made reference to the issue about increasing operational capability, which is a key part of what Police Scotland and SPA have set out with 2026. An important element of that is making sure uh, that they increase their operational capability in supporting frontline policing, something which I support and at a time when the uh, 2026 strategy uh, was published, I believe, and I recall was, uh, uh, was welcomed by uh, opposition parties as well. And what will be important is that Police Scotland and the SPA continue to drive that work forward as they take the implementation of 2026 forward. Lee MacArthur. Thanks very much. Um, bearing in mind what the Cabinet Secretary said about the welcome fall in uh, the uh, numbers of crime and particularly violent crime, does he share uh, my surprise and concern at Police Scotland's decision uh, to take forward training of around 50% of the police officers in Orkney in use of tasers for routine deployment? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, the member will be aware that the reason that the specially trained officers were introduced, some uh, 520 of them, was to help to improve resilience around tackling issues relating to uh, violent crime and crimes which involved or, uh, violent incidents or uh, incidents that involved a bladed weapon in order to provide greater protection to police officers. And we've only saw in the course of the last week uh, the risks that some of our police officers face. Uh, and of course, the member will also uh, understand that those risks are equally shared in our rural communities as well, where uh, additional response times to support uh, police officers can be longer than it may be in our urban areas. And that TASER was seen as being uh, one of the tools that could assist in helping to provide greater protection uh, to officers. So I do support the rollout of the specially trained officers across the country, including within our island communities, that will be used in a proportionate and in an appropriate fashion uh, to deal with incidents that do have elements of violence attached to them and where there are bladed weapons. And the specially trained officers are being provided with specific training in how to use these devices as and when appropriate. And I think this is about enhancing uh, police officers' safety overall, no matter what part of the country in which they operate. Question number six, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to amend the entitlement to access legal aid. Minister Annabel Ewing. Despite significant financial pressures, the legal aid system in Scotland is one of the leading jurisdictions in Europe in terms of scope, eligibility uh, and expenditure per capita, with 70% of our citizens eligible to some form of civil legal aid funding in almost all areas of life. As noted in Martin Evans' independent strategic review of legal aid, substantial cuts to legal aid entitlement in England and Wales have dramatically reduced the scope of legal aid available in family, social welfare, debt and housing law cases. The Scottish Government will not follow that approach. Our vision is that Scotland is a global leader in supporting citizens to defend their rights, resolve problems and settle disputes. Richard Lyle. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and can I welcome what she has said today. Could I ask though what plans, if any, the Scottish Government has to review in particular support to those who face additional challenges including from low-income backgrounds, in order to ensure that they can access the justice which we all rightly wish to see served. Minister. Uh, the legal aid system in Scotland is uh, already one of the most generous in the world, and around 75% of those who apply for legal aid receive that at no cost. The recent independent review that I referred to in my first answer made recommendations that would ensure the high degree of, that the high degree of support continues. And those proposals will uh, certainly be a, a priority in our consideration of how best to proceed with reform of the legal aid system. Question number seven, Polly McNeill. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on recent changes to the terms and conditions of interpreters used by the Scottish Court Service. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. The Scottish Government has a framework agreement for interpreting translation and transcription services, which is used by Scottish public sector bodies, including the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service. There are two suppliers on the framework agreement. There has been no recent changes to the framework terms and conditions. The Scottish Government does not contract directly with individual interpreters. Any terms and conditions of employment are a matter between the interpreter and the contractor. Polly McNeill. 
Is the Cabinet Secretary aware um, that a group of interpreters recently went on strike due to recent terms and conditions by Global Connections where they removed their payment for travel time? Would the Cabinet Secretary not agree that there should be a public interest in this matter since it is governed by his office? And that in the, in the case where interpreters have their travel time not paid to them, they would be, in effect, earning less than the minimum wage. So I do have to ask the Cabinet Secretary, would that not concern you if we had interpreters who, albeit employed on a self-employed basis, were earning less than the minimum wage, working in our Scottish courts? Surely this deserves some scrutiny. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, um, as I mentioned, uh, Scottish Procurement is aware of the issue uh, of uh, one of the suppliers having recently changed their terms and conditions with the interpreters uh, in relation to the allocation of work and the rates of uh, travel and expenses which they provide to them. Uh, the fixed rates in the framework agreement uh, which the Scottish Government has in place are inclusive of all early rates, travel up to 70 miles, expenses and management uh, fees. Uh, suppliers are required to bid on the basis uh, at the tender stage uh, on the principles set out within the framework agreement. It was for the bidders uh, in their tendering response to decide what fully inclusive fixed rates was appropriate to cover early travel rates, including travel up to 70 miles, expenses and management fees. Uh, but the Scottish Government does not contract directly uh, with uh, interpreters, and it's for the contractors to agree rates of pay with their own staff. However, if the member wants to write to me with more details on this matter, given that it does relate to the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service, I will ensure that the Chief Executive of the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service responds to the concerns that the members raise. Thank you very much. Uh, that concludes portfolio questions. Thanks to ministers, justice officers, law officers and members.